This episode is brought to you by Main Street Windows, a complete guide to Disney's whimsical tributes by me, Jeff Heimbuck. Order your signed copy today at OrchardHillPress.com or any other fine online bookseller. Hello and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I am Jeff. And top of the morning to you, George. How you doing today? I turned Jamaican. That is so not <laughs> Irish. Oh man. <laughs> I, so so that's gonna be that's gonna be one of our uh uh levels on Patreon.com is if you know, we get a certain level, we will no longer do accents. Ah, I am so disappointed in myself right now. Because Gosh, it, it started off like he's going to Irish. No, he went Jamaican. Nope, went Jamaican. I went, I went full cool runnings is what just happened right now. Man, well, well that totally botched my entire intro into the history segment. I'm fully embarrassed by this now. Well, that's okay. After the bump, no, bumper, nobody will remember. That's a fair point. So in that that case, let's just jump right to the bumper so you forget that terrible Jamaican accent. It's time for Disney History! After making a few feature films that combined live action with animation to some degree of success, such as The Three Caballeros and Song of the South and So Dear to My Heart, Walt Disney had his sights set on making another film in a very similar manner. So, in 1947, Walt Disney and a team of artists went to Ireland for inspiration. And while there, they visited the Irish Folklore Commission. Is that like the baseball commission? Uh, yeah, except they deal with shamrocks, right? Oh, that makes sense. Okay. I don't know. That's not a real fact. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah. It's, <laughs> now, we didn't know you. Though the uh, Walt Disney <laughs> Company <laughs> continued to liaise with the commission and its director, James DeLarge, over the coming decade based on Disney's desire to use Irish folklore as the basis of a film, Disney eventually decided to make an adaptation of Irish-American writer Hermione Templeton Cavanaugh's 1903 collection of stories, Darby O'Gill and the Good People. However, the idea was soon shelved when Walt got too busy with revived feature animation department and the planning of some theme park that he was working on at the time, and we all know that that would never work out. But ten years later, the film was put back into production, and this time as an all-live-action feature. And the title was changed to Darby O'Gill and the Little People, and a new script was written by Lawrence Watkin, who wrote several earlier Disney films. Robert Stevenson was assigned to direct after his success with Old Yeller and Johnny Tremaine. He will go on, years later, to direct Mary Poppins, but we're not talking about that just yet. Albert Sharp was cast as Darby O'Gill after Walt saw him in a play. Some newcomer named Sean Connery was cast as well, though this was his only film because he was so bad in it. We're just kidding, guys. <laughs> it was actually the film that brought Connery to the attention of uh, producer Albert Broccoli, who would go on to cast him as Bond, James Bond, in this in little independent film called Dr. No. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy O'Day was cast as the king of the leprechauns, but he received no screen credit whatsoever because Walt actually wanted audiences to think that the leprechauns were real. In fact, in the film, before it even begins, it has a thank you card with a note to the leprechauns from Walt thanking them for their participation in the film. So, what's the film all about? Well, Darby O'Gill is the caretaker of a wealthy estate where he lives with his daughter, Kate. However, his boss forces him to retire due to his age and the fact that he spends most of his time at the pub telling stories about his failed attempts to catch the King of the Leprechauns. His boss sends a younger man, Michael, to take his job just as Darby is captured by the Leprechauns. So he escapes and is able to reverse the situation by capturing King Brian and making him grant him three wishes. So Darby's first wish is for the king to stay with him for two weeks while he thinks about his other wishes. And then Darby accidentally wastes his second wish as Kate and Michael begin to like each other, but when she finds out that he is here to take over her father's job, she runs off and gets injured. <laughs> so as the uh, banshee of death, 
uh, comes for Katie, Darby uses his third wish to ward it off and save her life. However, it turns out they weren't after Katie at all and actually came for Darby. King Brian rides with Darby to inform him that Katie is all right and he releases Darby from the death. <laughs> it's called the death coach. That's what it, it is. It is called the yeah. death coach. That's right. It's it's I, I just giggle because it says death coach and I'm you know thinking this is a you know guy on the sidelines. Go death. Go. You could do it death. Go death. Only anyway. 20 more yards. <laughs> Sports. So, so. The, the the film then ends with Katie and Michael together and Darby living with them. Now, Aww. this death coach, not the person cheering death yeah. on, but the actual <laughs> death coach, uh, which is pronounced the Costa Bawa in the film, uh, it actually acquired its name from a, a slight misunderstanding. Um, Bodhar, I'm saying that wrong, but that's the Irish word for death rather than death. Now, death as in D-E-A-F, not D-E-A-T-H. Um, so the misunderstanding presumably arose when an accent uh, mispronounced death as death. So that language, it's a, it's a tricky <laughs> thing. I guess it is. So the, there are actually two, version, uh, two versions of the film soundtrack. Several of the original Irish actors' accents, notably Darby, Widow Sheila Shugru, King Brian, and the Leprechauns, were deemed too difficult for American audiences to understand just like a, the Communicore Weekly podcast. What are you talking and, about? <laughs> and they were consistently dubbed over with easier-to-understand voices, possibly from different voice actors. So the original soundtrack also contains some dialogue in Irish, especially from King Brian and his leprechaun subjects, which was subsequently changed in the overdub, overdub version to English alternatives. Um, but both versions have been used on television and home video releases. And I'm kind of confused. Are you confused? I think you're yeah. confused. Yeah, I think everybody's confused. I don't even know what okay. I'm saying half the time. <laughs> Clearly. So d despite its setting... The bulk of the film was actually shot at Disney's Golden Oak Ranch in Burbank, California. Second unit footage from Ireland, combined with matte paintings by the amazing Peter Ellenshaw, helped present a seamless picture of late 19th century Ireland. Many of the scenes containing humans and leprechauns use this magical thing called forced perspective, which I hope you've heard before, with the quote-unquote little people much further away from the camera. So this required stopping the camera's lens way down for an adequate depth of field and a, a, light, a lighting to compensate and everything to be seen. Um, in fact, the same technique is still used today, um, more recently in the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies, to make the hobbits and, you know, the dwarfs seem much smaller than the rest of the cast. So Darby O'Gill and the Little People opened on June 26, 1959. It was critically acclaimed for its great performances, groundbreaking special effects, and representation of Irish folklore. Unfortunately, audiences didn't respond the same way. Despite a full episode of the television show Disneyland that was devoted solely to promoting the release, it failed to find an audience. And it didn't find success until it was broadcast on television. But today, Darby O'Gill and the Little People has a moderately large fan base and has become a holiday classic around St. Patrick's Day. So the film really deserves more success than it has actually received. And, you know, it's a little slow paced and it has many qualities that make a great film. And it's enjoyable. Um, and the special effects, they, they look great. And, and most of the techniques created for this film are still in use today. Um, Leonard Moulton, the film critic, he actually <laughs> considers this to be one of the best Disney films, and that guy knows movies. So yes, he does. I'm going to trust in front of him. All those, all those treasures. He he does have movie treasures. Disney he does movie, have all those treasures. movie treasures. Yes, I mean, we've got a copy of the movie and enjoyed it. I thought the special effects were really top notch and really well done for a, a a movie created in the late part of the 1950s. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's a great flick. Um, so if you've seen it or you have any questions or thoughts about uh, Darby O'Gill and the Little People, give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a, He's a nerd. He's a geek. He's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah. It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is The Art of Big Hero 6 by Jessica Julius. And this is a chronicle book, you know, in their series, uh, The Art of Books, they, that they've done about a lot of animated films. And I always love them. They're always well done. Uh, and this one was released a few weeks before the film, but I didn't pick up my copy until recently. I always try to stay away from spoilers whenever I can. 
And, uh, you know, with the recent release of Big Hero 6 on Blu-ray and its Oscar win, yay, uh, I thought it was a great time to actually look at the book <laughs> and try to enjoy it. Uh, as we mentioned previously on Communicore Weekly, uh, Big Hero 6 is one of my favorite films, and I know Jeff loves it as well. I do. And, yeah, and to me, it might be actually one of my favorite Disney films. It's it's up there with Lilo and Stitch and The Incredibles, uh, which are both my favorite films. I love all of them. So, um, but you know, even as even I was just getting into the uh, the book itself, which does feature a lot uh, on Baymax, as you'd expect. After watching the trailer, I even knew that he was going to be a huge part of the film and a huge part of you know Disney pop culture as it is. Um, the art of Big Hero Six itself. The book is a really quick read compared to some of the other chronicle of chronicle art of titles that they've done. Way too many words there, um, but it still possesses uh, all the beauty of the other books itself. Big Hero Six, as we've said before, is a gorgeous film, not just because of the increases in technology that they've had over the past few years, but because of the care that they took in crafting the world, and it really shows up in this because. Almost 50% of the book is dedicated to the creation of San Francisco. Uh, it, it really shows how important the backgrounds are for the entire film and how it has become a character in and of itself, really has. Uh, there are some jaw-droppingly gorgeous paintings and computer illustrations that show the evolution of the city in the, in the whole project. And even though many of the paintings are fully digital, they still look like watercolors and ink drawings. And that was one of the wonderful things about the art of Big Hero 6 is you really get to see that they used a lot of watercolors to create the, the film itself. The uh, filmmakers also spent a lot of time, you know, walking around San Francisco and Tokyo, taking photos, using those photos as references, you know, sort of taking the best of both cities. And, and one of the interesting parts of the book is they show you how they developed uh, San Francisco by imagining after the earthquake. That happened in, was it 1906 in San Francisco? Uh, yeah, I think that's it. We'll go with that, yeah. Um, the people that lived there, the large population, rebuilt it uh, in the style of Tokyo. Like, there had been a lot of immigration from that area, and that's why you see a lot of that in the film itself. Uh, they even show uh, over a couple pages how they went to design all the furniture throughout the uh, entire film, as well, which I thought was really nice. Uh, character development for Big Hero 6 was, of course, a big part of the book. That was pretty much the other 50% of the book. And uh, since there were some changes made from the comic series, the artist really showed the progression that they had to make, that they had to make to get to the characters that we saw in the final film itself. Each character gets about three to four pages to themselves, as well as parts to focus on how the characters work together visually. Uh, one of the original designs for Hero's Hero Suit <laughs> was actually red, but they changed it to purple to contrast with Baymax's red hero suit, especially when they were flying around together. And there's a great quote from John Lasseter about how they designed Hero. Quote, Hero was a challenge because he's a gangly 14-year-old boy genius. He needs to be appealing, but not a cutesy kid. We found his design by studying young teenagers who are really brilliant in science or the arts, who are so utterly focused on their particular interest that dressing and combing their hair is an afterthought. End quote. And I just thought it was neat because they really went into the backstory uh, for all the characters. He's pretty much talking about every teenager ever, though, right? Pretty much so. Okay. Pretty much so, yeah. So the, uh, the section on Baymax, of course, is the largest and focuses on how long it took them to, to narrow down his shape and his overall look. Because once they dis, you know, decided upon being the soft, huggable robot, they sort of had to get to the appropriate size uh, and feel for him. Um, we also see a lot of the different suits they, they designed for Hero and Baymax to use together. And, you know, how the, the there's actually a, a blow apart of Baymax that shows the robotic parts on the inside and how it would function. And there, there was even a page about Honey Lemon's purse and how it works with like architectural or scientific drawings to show how the technology would work. Really, really cool. Uh, the last couple of pages of the book look at some things that didn't quite make it called The Vanished Villains. And there were a couple subplots that they pulled uh, partway through making the film. There was a section on a girl gang called the Fujitas, and there was a TV host called Mr. Sparkles, 
which makes me think of the Simpsons. The Simpsons, yeah. Yes, he was he was he was a megalomaniacal villain. And then there were the bonsai bombers, but there wasn't much about them except a, a couple of drawings. Uh, overall, I really love the book. Recommend it, especially if you're a fan of Big Hero Six or animation, and you'd like to get a little insight into how they made this incredible film. So definitely go out and pick up a copy if you can. This week's book is The Art of Big Hero Six. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. This window is actually located in Hong Kong Disneyland, and it reads, Exotic Specimens, Flower Street Nursery, Paul Comstock, John Sorensen, were always growing. Now, Paul Comstock uh, contributed to the landscape of Disneyland Paris, and then he was promoted to chief landscape architect and designer of Disney's Animal Kingdom before it opened in 1998. And then he later became the director of landscape design for Hong Kong Disneyland. And then John Sorensen is the director of landscape and architecture for Imagineering overall. You don't know what you know till we know you. Don't you. Know, you just don't know. There's one little fact we bet you did it. One little fact we bet you did it. No. A Winnie the Pooh 18-hole miniature golf course had been planned for Fort Wilderness. It was going to be situated near the new western town and was supposed to have been open by late 1973. Future plans had also called for a miniature golf course near the Magic Kingdom entrance or even in front of the Contemporary Resort. <laughs> no date had been set for that one at all. Now we know you. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. I don't know how to break this to you guys, but goats are everywhere. <laughs> not just in theme parks, not just resorts, but also in the shops. And uh, this week's is actually located at Downtown Disney at Walt Disney World Resort in Goofy's Candy Company. So if you walk in and you take a look at the back wall of the candy making station, you'll actually see the Goofy Periodic Table of Elements. Now, for you science folks out there, you're probably thinking, I already know all these elements. I don't, I don't need to know anything more about this. But you'd be wrong, because when you take a closer look, all of these elements are broken up a little bit differently. Dare I say, a wee bit differently to fit into our <laughs> Irish theme? No? Okay. Anyway... <laughs> So, for example, there are the core Disney elements, such as Tinconium and Plutonium, which actually is a real mm. element. Um, I mean, how else do you power a DeLorean? Um, <laughs> there's also the elements of royal degree, like trit Tritonium and Creekium. And then there's the elements of evil, like Sciaronium and Cruelonium. And finally, the seven smallest elements, like Grump Grumpium and Happium. So uh, lots of crazy uh, elements on that goofy periodic table over there. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. And, you know, we've got a special way of turning our cadets from grumpium to happium. Do we? Oh, yeah. I see what Talk you did there. A segue. That is a Se segwanium. Segwanium? Se Se segwanium? I don't know. Anyway, uh, we're going to announce this week's prize winner. And remember, all you have to do to be part of our year of a million or so limited time cadets is email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. Tell us your name, your address, and your birthday. Because we are sending out special things for everybody's birthday, but the prize winner, that's random every week. So the sooner you get your name to us, the sooner you'll be in the drawing. Uh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, because I'm not a mathematician, I'm a librarian. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't do numbers. The only numbers you know Dewey are Decimal. Dewey Decimal. Yes, yes that's it. Both okay, went so for this... the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. So this week's book is the, uh, or the prize, yay, is a book. Go figure. It's The Art of Big Hero 6 by Jessica Julius, the one that we just reviewed. And it is still sealed in plastic. So it's in mint condition. Mint condition. Yay. This week's winner is Tegan S. from Colorado Springs. Colorado. Hooray! So, yay! So look for your package, and as soon as you get that book, enjoy it, and take some photos of you enjoying it, and post them on our Facebook page or email them to us. 
because we'd love to see you with it. And I guess that brings us to the end of another episode. Yes, it so does. Thank you guys for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Be sure to leave us a comment and give us a rating on iTunes. Wherever you're, li- you're listening to or watching the show, we want to hear from you. Yes, we do. Uh, email us, as I mentioned earlier, at communicoreweekly at gmail.com because there's still plenty of time to be part of the year or so of a million time limited. You just... Year or so. Wow. <laughs> George, how many weeks into this year are we already and you still can't get it correct? It is the I year of a million or so limited, so limited time, time cadets. Time cadets. I did it right with the prize thing. It wasn't Does even it? written down. Yeah, you still need to get it right all the time. I know, because we are a professional podcast. Oh, so professional that you made me lose my place. Where were we? Oh, yeah. Oh, like us likes. on Facebook. That's it. <laughs> like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. Yes, and follow all of our craziness on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And, of course, leave us a voicemail on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. And visit CommunicoreWeekly.com. Visit the Communistore part of the website and pick up some awesome T-shirts and a copy of Communicore Weekly, the musical. And, of course, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope for your official cadet membership card and stickers to Communicore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And visit uh, patreon.com slash Communicore Weekly and find out how you can help support us and get some extra special content. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. And I'm also apologizing for the terrible accents again this week. Thanks so much for continuing to listen to us, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. You're making me crazy. <laughs>